Ever wonder why 95% of leads do not convert? Why cold call rates are down and prospects don't open our emails? Why our responses of robo calls and implanting pixels to track user interaction, mostly without permission, is backfiring spectacularly? Well, that's what we intend to find out here in the Buyer Side Chat podcast. There are scores of podcasts about selling, but most miss the shift that has come upon the buying selling process. The initiative has since moved from the supply to the demand side. The Buyer Side Chat, your podcast of record for B2B buying, talks to actual buyers, persons, not personas, in the quest to understand the real buyer's journey, their trials and tribulations, challenges and outcomes they're striving for. Welcome to the Buyer Side Chat. Thank you for your time and for joining us in this session. I have a favor to ask. While you continue to listen to the podcast, please leave a comment or rating at iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts from. I personally look at each comment and will give you a shout out to each of you in our following episodes. It means a lot to hear from you. Today we have with us Laura Cesari, founder of the research firm Supply Chain Insights. The company is helping supply chain leaders pave new directions in supply chain management. In the last decade, procurement has become more of an island within manufacturing and we have automated procurement to make it more efficient but in the process we've made it less effective. So our planning processes in our manufacturing don't really go into material buying. They basically stop with material manufacturing constraints down to finite scheduling and we're very dependent on MRP, which MRP is in the operational executional horizon. And so a lot of the you know, basics around aggregate buying, uh, supplier development have been lost over the last decade, sadly. And you know, when I work with companies and I ask them to draw you know, the supply chains within their manufacturing organizations, most companies have a trend that they're starting to draw out procurement as kind of an island, right? That the only connection is MRP and that the evolution of the CPO against the supply chain leader, we've become much more functional and the focus on purchase price variance will throw the supply chain out of balance. Our guest today is Laura Cesari, founder of the research firm Supply Chain Insights. As an enterprise strategist, Laura focuses on the changing face of enterprise technologies. Her research is designed for the early adopter seeking first mover advantage. With more than 30 years in diverse supply chain experience, Laura spent 12 years as an industry analyst with Gartner Group, AMR Research and Altimeter Group. Prior to becoming a supply chain analyst, she spent 15 years in building of supply chain software at Manogistics and Descartes Systems Group and several years as a supply chain practitioner at Procter & Gamble, Kraft General Foods, Clorox and Dreher's Grand Ice Cream, now a division of Nestle. A prolific writer, Laura is the author of the enterprise software blog Supply Chain Shaman with over 15,000 readers every week. She also writes a blog for Forbes and is a LinkedIn influencer. She co-authored two books, Bricks Matter and Supply Chain Matrix That Matter. Academically, Laura is a continual learner. She has an MBA from the Wharton School of Business and a BS in Chemical Engineering from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Laura is currently enrolled in a DBA program at Temple University in Research Methods. Now on to this insightful conversation with Laura Cicely. Laura, welcome to the Buyer Side Chat. I'm delighted to have you here today and uh, learn from your uh, vast experience of dealing with the buyer side of the process. Welcome. Oh, oh thank you so much. And uh you know, my heart goes out to everyone in India and Asia struggling with these COVID times, uh, tough stuff. Um, I, I think it's uh, heartening that we may have global companies, but we need to act regionally. But my name is Laura Ciceri, and I'm the founder of Supply Chain Insights. And my road has been 20 years of manufacturing experience, uh, buying materials, running factories, running distribution centers for companies like Procter & Gamble, uh, General Foods, which got purchased by Philip Morris, which then spun off to Kraft, uh, Clorox, uh, makers of bleach and uh, salad dressings, and Dryer's Grand Ice Cream, which was purchased by Nestle. 
And then I went and built software for about 10 years with a company called Banigistics in the planning space. And then I decided I needed a mega perspective. So I went to Gartner Group and was an analyst at Gartner for a couple of years. And then I decided Gartner didn't care as much about supply chain as I did. So I went to a company called AMR Research and ran the research teams there. And most people don't remember AMR, but it was a very focused company on delivering research to the line of business user, whereas Gartner focuses more on the IT buyer. And thought I'd be there until I retired, but the founder wanted out and he sold the company to Gartner. And I'm like, I don't believe in the Gartner model. So Laura is not ready to retire, so she's got to find something to do. So I started Supply Chain Insights. And I write in front of the firewall. I write for Forbes. I write for LinkedIn. I write on a blog called The Supply Chain Shaman. It's hard for me to believe that the blog Supply Chain Shaman is now almost a decade old. It's got 500 posts. And I take the best read post and build an ebook each year, which is available on Amazon and Flipping Book. And I have a couple of hard copy books. But I try to help business leaders gain first mover advantage by understanding the shifts in technologies and processes to really drive a difference. And um, I think that most supply chains are stuck. We've got a backward slide over the last decade, and I just want to help people to move forward. Wow. That's, that's like, it's triggering so many thoughts in my mind already. Uh, but let me start with a basic question. The way a buyer's journey is looked at in a B2B buying selling scenario from the sales point of view is significantly different to say the least from what actually is going on in the buyer's side. Where, where is the major disconnect uh, from your point of view? Um, well, I think there are a couple of major disconnects, um, and I'm just going to – so let's focus on buying materials for manufacturing and uh, looking at consumer products or food and beverage or uh, household durables. In the last decade, procurement has become more of an island within manufacturing, and we have – automated procurement to make it more efficient, but in the process, we've made it less effective. So our planning processes in our manufacturing don't really go into material buying. They basically stop with manufacturing constraints down to finite scheduling, and we're very dependent on MRP, which MRP is in the operational executional horizon. And so a lot of the you know, basics around aggregate buying, uh, supplier development have been lost over the last decade, sadly. And, you know, when I work with companies and I ask them to draw, you know, the supply chains within their manufacturing organizations, most companies have a trend that they're starting to draw out procurement as kind of an island, right? That the only connection is MRP and that the evolution of the CPO against the supply chain leader, we've become much more functional and the focus on purchase price variance will throw the supply chain out of balance. So when a seller of goods interacts with a company, they'll have many people that they'll interact with. It'll be a person in new product launch or new product development who's trying to buy materials. There'll be a procurement buyer. There may be a buyer that's dealing with outsourced manufacturing. But the communication within that organization has become tougher. And the signals for procurement to be able to align the buy to the company's needs are more arduous and you know, more difficult than they were a decade ago. And uh, a lot of it has become, you know, a focus on indirect and a focus on strong functional silos, which makes procurement less effective and harder for someone to effectively build a relationship with. So let, let me step back a bit and ask you this, that originally, if you see the role of the procurer, it was essentially to negotiate a better price and they were not really experts in either material or 
business process or manufacturing process or any of that uh, their role traditionally when when if you go back in time was to negotiate and from there as you rightly pointed out the role of the cpo emerged which was sort of like what happened to the cio during the y2k that the cio moved to the cxo table and the objective at that point was when the cpo role emerged post uh, uh, post the 2000 crash is uh, right. is that this role is going to also go to the CXO table, but something went wrong there, right? Uh, what is actually going on this side so that the sellers can understand what should be the approach to actually manage this multi-member team, which is actually the de facto CPO today? Well, I think that uh, getting clear on the process in that craft, you know, it's not like Procter & Gamble, not like uh, Unilever, you know, there's no one real model. And to, if I were selling to uh, food and beverage CPG, I would identify my roles and my personas and my interaction and who's managing outsource manufacturing, where they are on supplier development capabilities, uh, do they have capabilities for aggregate buying capabilities? You know, a decade ago, there was a lot of focus on strategic buying, aggregate buying, commodity uh, plans. Today, there's less of that. So I would be looking at that and I'd be looking at, you know, the company's ability to do bi-directional orchestration to look at alternate bills of material, alternate sourcing, and uh, the risk management practices. And I would look by persona at that interaction and I would not generalize. And I would try to open up the doors the best I could through working with new product launch, uh, ingredients, services, uh, helping uh, any way I could, because that's how you're gonna drive new business. Sure, so how do you get your foot in the door? I mean, how do I, as a supplier or a vendor wanting to deal with Unilever or a Procter & Gamble or, or any, any large, uh, company, how do I know when do I start mapping the organization for, for starters? How do I know who is actually uh, working on supply development or whether they're doing it at all? If they're not, so, so where do you begin and when do you begin? So I think that you begin with new product launch. Uh, there are lots of um, shows in the old days, pre-COVID, where you would have like ingredient fairs or you would have, uh, you know, plastic forums, whatever you're mm -hmm. selling. I would, I would start with trying to get my foot in the door for a new product launch. New product launch is responsible for cost savings. They're mm -hmm. responsible for new product ingredients. And so I would try to open up the door there. And then I would, you know, build the best relationships I can, and I would start to map the organizations by asking simple questions like, you know, how do you manage buying? Uh, do you do aggregate spend analysis? Uh, are you doing MRP or DDMRP? Are you uh, looking at supplier development? What's important in your buying processes? And then I would start mapping and moving through the organization to try to understand what drives value. So uh, tell me, uh, Laura, how open are potential buyers or prospects to answer such questions? Will they actually share what is the decision-making uh, map inside the organization? I mean, do, do you actually get to find that out? I. You know, I've never been selling. I've bought, but I've never <laughs> sold. Uh, I think, you know, yeah, I think so. Uh, I think that most people want to help, uh, and you've got to ask the questions in the right way, and you can't be aggressive, but I hmm. think most people want to help. And uh, you can easily find out if they've got supplier development programs or what their corporate social responsibility programs are and, uh, you know, just from their website, uh, you know, their corporate ethics. But I find, yes, I think so. I, I don't find that to be a barrier. 
how has the buyer actually changed in the last two decades because prior to internet the buyer was dependent upon the sales person for a lot of information your source of information besides the trade shows that you just mentioned was the sales person and obviously post internet that has completely changed i mean today you don't need to talk to any sales person to get information and uh, data being sort of shared says that 60-70% of the buying journey is over even before a single vendor is spoken to. Where are you on this? How, how has the change happened and what change are you seeing? Well, I think that there's more catalog information. Uh, there's more ingredient information. Uh, a definitely available, but I think you still need door openers. Uh, you still need the ability to forge relationships. While you've got a lot of content available, I think that you know there's no substitute for real relationships. So um, I think that the salesperson's become more of a relationship manager. How has the buyer's process changed internally because of this disintermediation of information that has happened? Uh, I think the uh, buyer has become more of an order taker. Um, and, um, you know, I find that there are more junior buyers. Uh, there's less focus on strategic relationship development. Um, and uh, so I think that's a problem. Can you elaborate a bit on this? Let's, let's sort of unpack this thought. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there's been a focus on outsource procurement. There's mm -hmm. been a focus on RFPs, RFQs, you know, mechanized procurement. Mm -hmm. There's been a focus on, uh, you know, how can I outsource payables? Uh, you know, we've focused on mechanization, uh, not necessarily value. Um and relationships and i think that you know the cpo has been very focused on cost and mm. i think we have more junior buyers so so that cost factor of minimizing cost or maximizing value whichever you look at it still remains a key activity for the cpo i think it's a driving activity for the cpo the cpo typically will report to the cfo and it's you know very much about cost, not necessarily about value. And most companies don't don't even know how to answer the question, how do you define value? It's actually a funny activity to ask companies, how do you define value? You know, first you've got to be very comfortable with pregnant pauses because you're going to get this look of, I wish you hadn't asked me that question. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah, it's unfortunately become much more about cost and less about value and companies struggle to define value and you know both the IT organization and the chief procurement officer now have more of a reporting relationship to finance and it unfortunately much more about cost. It's time for a short break. As we went into the break I asked Laura if the narrative that puts the CPO at the CXO table becoming more strategic in their role by becoming business process or say manufacturing experts. Is it actually playing out the way many CPOs believe it is? When we come back, you will hear what Laura sees from our vantage point. We'll be back after a short break. Stay with us. You are listening to a Business Podcast Network original. Podcasting is the fastest growing content marketing opportunity, which is untapped. We can help you craft your audio strategy and help leverage the wide reach and easy streaming capability that the smartphone penetration provides. It is easy, it is powerful and personal. Talk to us to find out how podcasting can help you build your brand and reach out to your targets like never before. Write to us at bpn at bizcast.in that is bpn at biz c a s t dot i n business podcast network podcasts end to end welcome back i'm shubhanjan sarkar your host and the founder of pitchlink the buyer seller engagement platform 
Right before the break, I asked Laura if the CPOs are becoming more strategic in their role by becoming business process or say manufacturing process experts. Laura doesn't think it is playing out exactly like that. Listen in. So this whole discourse that the CPO is moving into a more strategic role and they're becoming business process or manufacturing process experts and, and thereby they're in a much better position to add value you don't think that is happening, is it? No. I, you know, I, I do a lot of speaking at um, the strategic procurement organizations in the United States. I do research on supplier development programs, uh, corporate social responsibility programs, uh, mm. you know, how people plan procurement at the building and networks. And, I think that we have focused on procurement efficiency at the cost of procurement effectiveness. And to me, an effective procurement organization is managing networks and looking at value. And an efficient organization is looking at, you know, cost and uh, reducing cycles. Hmm. And so I think that the strategic CPO is hard to find. Obviously, this is something very close to your heart, what I can sense. Uh, dig in a little more in the sense, why do you think that is happening? While uh, it's quite obvious that that path, which was sort of developing of the CPO's role to be a strategic contributor and not only just a negotiator of price, made a lot more sense. I mean, pretty much like, as I said, if I, I draw a very simple parallel with the CIO's role prior to Y2K. I mean, the CIO was just, again, someone who was procuring, who, who was, I mean, actually uh, uh, taking calls and saying, hey, my, my cartridge for my printer is over. Can you get your team to come and install it or whatever? My driver is not working. So that, that was really the role of the, uh, there, there was no CIO. It was the head of IT or something like that. But, but that, became a strategic role because technology was playing that role and technology came center uh, stage for any company, right? And and procurement has a very similar kind of trajectory, yet you feel that it's not really going that direction, the strategic direction. Why do you think uh, that is happening? Well, I think in the last decade, we've had what I call the backward slide in companies in manufacturing organizations being able to deliver value. And the reason I say that is we're holding 20 days of more of inventory on average. Uh, when we went into this uh, COVID period and we, uh, then we did in the Great Recession and we um, are stuck at the intersection of growth and operating margin. And we've been very focused on cost and you can you know, squeeze pennies, but not necessarily drive value. And most companies are not clear on how do they define supply chain excellence? How do they define uh, value as they look at source, make, and deliver together? And we're not good at designing organizations. So I have a chemical engineering background. I wouldn't have been able to get out of chemical engineering school if I couldn't design heat exchangers and distillation columns. But only 9% of companies actively design their supply chains, and 80% of resources are in the supply network. And so when you look at the design of the network, we should actively be designing not just where the sources are coming from, but the flows and, uh, you know, you know, source, make, and deliver together. Uh, and we should be actively driving bi-directional orchestration. So let me tell you a story. I used to run an ice cream plant, and I managed the dairy boards on uh, California. Uh, California has some pretty active dairy. And there were 22 uh, different formulas for vanilla ice cream. And depending upon what was happening in the dairy markets and what was happening in my commercial markets, I would choose the formula that I was going to run based upon dairy fat and skim and the composition of milk, right, milk powder, et cetera. And I basically did bidirectional orchestration to be able to deliver high-quality ice cream and manage cost market-to-market. Today, 
people can't get out of their silos to even have a conversation about alternate bills of material or mm-hmm. alternate sourcing, right? Because we're so stuck in transactional trans, you know, efficiency, uh, you know, wrote bill of materials, you know, fixed suppliers, um, you know, RFPs, et cetera, that we can't have cross-functional discussions to even, you know, have that kind of discussion. And, and I think it's sad because there's so much value cross-functionally market to market if only we could, you know, break the chains of the silos. And I think the evolution of the CIO and the CPO reporting to the chief financial officer and the heavy investment in ERP really are chains that bind us into, you know, driving efficient, less effective processes. This is really interesting because what you just described actually should have been made very, very easy using technology. The the example that you used, a, a, a scenario like that should actually have been aided by technology. And, and this has not happened. Instead, technology decided to simplify things saying, okay, we'll only do it this way. Mm-hmm. Why, why do you think that is? Well, we invested in transactional systems on relational databases, which are very black and white. Mm-hmm. And the supply chain is really very gray and full of semantics. And particularly as we deal with procurement, where we're dealing with grades and alternate sourcing and alternate bill of material, that technology was never set up to deal in the shades of gray. And we basically invested in functional efficiency and inward facing processes. And the uh, ironically, our operations became more global, more dependent on networks, but we do not have interoperability between the networks. So Ariba doesn't interoperate with Alemica, which doesn't interoperate with Eda Open. Uh, there's nothing that forces interoperability between procurement and transportation networks. And I actually lead a group called the Network of Networks. It's a volunteer group. Anybody can join it. And we study how networks are evolving in network technology. And there's no single sign-on. There's no single directory. You know, we're not really holding people accountable for being good trading partners. And so the business models that evolved at the technology level really forced us into efficient procurement, very focused into the industry model, uh, where indirect procurement is much more black and white than direct procurement. Hmm. And as a result, you know, we've just put all our energy there. And a lot of the understanding of the direct world for semantic reasoning is lacking in the industry. And we are continuing to go into relational databases, hard-coded logic that doesn't really serve the supply chain very well. Very interesting. So where do you think this is headed, uh, Laura? According to you, if you look out 10 years from now, where do you see procurement and the, the procurement role being? And how do you think the vendor side can help make this transaction a guaranteed better better outcome for both sides. Well, I'm hoping that the pandemic is a crisis that we don't let go to waste. You know, if you look at the pandemic, we have lots of stories of supplier failure. And whether it's the chip issues uh, that we're dealing with now in automotive or whether it's the plastics issues, we are not good at managing strategic relationships at a manufacturing level. And I would actually like to have all the people selling goods to reward manufacturers for good forecast, right? And, you know, it, it was interesting. I saw this practice when Jabel, I worked with Jabel, they would actually have a price structure. If a company gave them a good forecast, they got a good discount. If they had a horrible forecast, they were penalized. Well, we have nothing that puts teeth into, you know, the forecast sharing or, you know, the predictive of supply. Uh, we have nothing that, you know, rewards people for being good trading partners for, you know, ASNs or, you know, electronic delivery. You know, we've focused on big sticks like 
you know, payables versus, you know, carrots. And I would like to see us focus more on carrots of, you know, good behavior. Um, and I, I'm hoping that some of the lessons out of the pandemic will be kind of illuminating that people can stop their wayward practices of, you know, transactional efficiency that leads us down, you know, paths that really aren't good for the organization. Do you really believe that vendors can actually induce better behavior in terms of procurement, in terms of buying in the buyer's organization? Depends upon how important that ingredient is. Uh, if it's a, if it's a commodity, no. But if it's something that is, you know, uh, highly sought after and uh, a specialized material, yeah, I, I think that, you know, giving discounts for good forecast and then your buyer may laugh at you, uh, you know, is something to consider, particularly for somebody in contract manufacturing services uh, where you're actually tying assets to future demand. Uh, and I also think that you can reward for being a good buyer, you know, in terms of number of changes on purchase orders. The changes on purchase orders went through the roof in the pandemic. And, um, you know, purchase order synchronization was very problematic. So, you know, purchase order cleanliness, uh, you know, matching, uh, you know, I. I'm a small vendor and I probably deal with, I don't know, 120 outsider services. And it's a nightmare. I, you know, you know, invoices get lost. Uh, it's hard to find an invoice. They pay the wrong bank. Uh, it's just a nightmare. And so, you know, I think, you know, the easier a company is to do business with, we should reward them. When we think of influencers in a buying decision, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, if you're buying something you've already bought, you have a system in place. But if you're trying to buy something new, it may be technology, it may be material, it may be you know, machinery or whatever it is. I presume that you will take help of external experts as an organization to sort of focus on the right path or right flow how important is peer groups in this decision-making process? So if you are the head of procurement of a company, how likely are you to talk to a group of peers and say, hey, this is what we are planning to do. Uh, do you guys have any suggestion? Well, it depends upon the buying. Um, so in my market, which is advice, um, you know, I give advice and you know, the future of technology, it's very relational, uh, you know, and most of my business comes from helping people. So I have, you know, 322,000 people on LinkedIn. I create goodwill by helping people find jobs, helping connect people. And that usually, you know, will lead to business for me in terms of, you know, what goes around comes around. But if I'm selling a commodity product like a plastic or a, I don't know, a gum or a resin, uh, you know, that's not a relational sell. That's very much about new product launch. You know, I get the product and then I start to land and expand and I'm working the organization strategically. So it's very different depending upon what you're selling. If, if I'm a, or rather, if you are the, CPO and you're buying some new complex technology or product or new uh, new commodity for a new line of business, for example, uh, how likely are you to take into account your peer group who are not necessarily inside your company, but outside your company, your, your peer group in, uh, in the procurement community and take their advice while you are looking at this new purchase challenge? Again, I think it depends upon what it is. If it's mm -hmm. equipment, uh, you mm -hmm. probably will. If it's okay. services, you probably will. If it's an ingredient, you're going to mm -hmm. be looking at performance and new product launch. So it really depends upon what you're buying. The Buyer Site Chat is brought to you by Pitchlink, the buyer-seller engagement platform. 
Pitchlink enables high quality interactions between buyers and sellers through presentation and discussion modules. Sellers create personalized sales presentations and reach out to prospects through a non-intrusive, buyer-qualified engagement. Pitchlink requires no installation or download and holds the entire repository of sales collaterals and buyer-seller conversation. Talk to us to know more about how you can engage with customers without intrusion. Call us on 650-847-5884. That is 650-847-5884. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. I, I really appreciate you taking the time right in the morning. I really appreciate that you did reach out and, and we could connect and, and we could do this today. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, thanks for helping people around the world. And please be safe in India. I'm praying for all my Indian friends. Thank you. We have a fantastic lineup over the next couple of episodes featuring great conversations unraveling in depth how the real buyers buy. Stay tuned. Thank you for being with us today on the Buyer Side Chat. This is the podcast of record for the Buyer Side Journey. And those who know, that's the journey that matters. We hope this conversation helped you with insights that you can go and apply right now to your own value transaction process. See you in the next episode of the Buyer Side Chat.